I'm Eric Clemetti from the Department of Geosciences, uh, and thanks for coming to this evening's talk, uh, sponsored by the Ronneberg Series and the Department of Geosciences. And we're we're excited to excited to have it tonight. A couple of quick reminders: if you have a cell phone, you might want to make it be quiet the whole time. Um, and I have uh, been given permission by our speaker that if you do desire to tweet or anything like that about the talk, you can feel free to do that as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Louise Proctor. She is the director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and she will be, she's, she's spent her career working on asteroids and planets and moons, and tonight she's going to be talking to us about one of uh, my favorite moons of the solar system, and, and hope, hopefully that we'll be arriving back there sometime soon. So without further ado, I will hand it off. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've had a really fun day hanging out with many of you, I think sometimes more than once, uh, but it's been great. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight about uh, Europa, but particularly the exploration of Europa. So a little bit of the history of its exploration and uh, the plans for the future. Uh, in the middle, I will give you some of the science results, some of what we know about Europa. Um, this is from my background, which is more geology focused. Uh, so there's a lot more that I'm not including tonight, but I only have a limited time. Time. So, first of all, um, the first person to point uh, an instrument at the uh, Jupiter system was the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei, Galilei uh, in 1610. Um, his instrument was really little more than a, a cardboard tube with uh, some lenses in it, but it, it dis he discovered some phenomenal things. Uh, so he found what he called these four little stars, and he observed them over a number of nights and found that they actually moved around with respect to Jupiter. And so this was a really big deal because um, it was the first time that we'd really Really seen bodies moving around another body. And at the time, there was this whole newfangled idea that the Earth and the planets might actually be moving around the sun, right, which uh, a lot of people did not want to believe. And so this provided support for that uh, Copernican uh, revolution, basically. Um, so that was in 1610. It took a long time before we really learned much more about uh, Europa in particular. So Europa is the second moon, second large moon out from Jupiter. Um, and for a long time, we didn't know anything about it. It was almost 200 years before the mass of Europa was determined to within 10% of the current value, which isn't bad given the kind of uh, telescopes that they had back then. Um, and the orbital resonances were discovered among the moons. I'll talk a bit more about those later, but those were discovered by the uh, mathematician Pierre Laplace. Um, about another 50 years later, um, another astronomer, uh, Father Pietro Secchi, estimated the diameter of Europa, and he got that to within 6% of the current value. So again, pretty good going given the instruments that they were using. Um, another 50 years on from that, um, uh, these, these are all astronomers. Um, the astronomer uh, Pickering suggested that Europa might be a low density body, and he was looking at the brightness of Europa. So he thought that either it was a, a moon that was covered in bright clouds, or that maybe it was comprised of a swarm of uh, comets made of white sand, right, which sounds kind of ridiculous to us today, but he was the first person to really try and relate the characteristics that he could see through his telescope to what might be happening on the surface. It turned out he was completely wrong about both of those things, but it was a good effort. Um, in 1927, um, the astronomer Joel Stebbins found that Europa is trapped in a synchronous, uh, it's in synchronous rotation. That means the same face is pointing towards Jupiter at all times. So it's similar to our moon with the, the same face 
pointing towards the Earth all the time. And then in 1952, um, Howard Urey, who was a, a, a fantastic chemist, was the first person to suggest that the um, densities of some of these moons suggested that there might be water ice on the surface, and furthermore, that there might be um, what we now know as cryovolcanic flows, maybe cryovolcanism. So volcanism made of water, right, not of rock, uh, that that might be going on on some of these moons. So he was kind of ahead of his time in that respect. Um, starting to get into the early space age, uh, in the 1950s, um, it was discovered that the Earth had these radiation belts called Van Allen belts. And at the same time, Jupiter was also recognized as having a, a substantial magnetic field um, containing extensive energetic plasma. So these are, are charged particles from the solar wind that would get trapped within this magnetic field of Jupiter. Um, getting back to Europa itself, in the 60s, um, Fred Whipple, who uh, I, I point out here, he was the guy who came up with a model for comets that said that they might be uh, dirty snowballs, right, with the idea that the, uh, if you get a dirty snowball and you let the sun shine on it, after a while the ice will all sublimate away and you'll be left with a little pile of dirt. And he thought comets uh, were like that. And that's a model that it, it's starting to, uh, we're starting to realize that comets are a lot more complicated, but that was a model that stuck for a very long time. Um, but he also looked at the surface of Europa and suggested that Europa had frozen water ice and also maybe some other uh, frozen gases on the surface. And then in the 70s, we started getting um, information about the temperature of Europa, uh, discovered that it was 120 Kelvin, that is pretty cold, uh, and also some rudimentary composition information. Um, and finally, it was found that it probably had a low conductivity porous surface so that the surface itself might be covered in something like frost. So at this point, um, we're in the 1970s, okay? The first observations were um, almost 350 years prior to that. And it's taken that long for Europa to go from being a little speck of light to something that actually has a personality, right? Uh, it, you know, we roughly know the size, we know the mass, we know the diameter, um, and we, we're starting to get an idea of what the surface might look like. But that was it for a while. So it took spacecraft to really um, start to tell us what the surface of Europa was like and what has been going on in this incredible moon. So around this time, um, actually getting back to 1962, the Mariner 2 spacecraft was sent to Venus. So that was sort of the beginning of the robotic space exploration age. And at that time, scientists and engineers started to think about um, exploring the outer solar system. Uh, and they realized that some of the outer giant planets, in fact, all of them, um, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and even Pluto, were going to be aligned in the 1980s. This, was, uh, this conjunction was very unusual, and they realized that it wouldn't happen again for another 170 years. So they started thinking about how could they send a mission that would explore all of these bodies while they were in this very favorable uh, alignment. Um, and they had two problems that they had to solve. One was they were very worried about the asteroid belt, right? You've all seen movies where, you know, people in spacecraft are flying through the asteroid belt and dodging asteroids here and there, right? Um, they thought the asteroid belt was full of dust and debris that would damage any spacecraft that tried to fly through it. Uh, the other problem they had was they knew about these giant radiation belts around Jupiter, and they were very worried that if they sent a spacecraft to that system or even to fly through the system, that the uh, electronics on the spacecraft would just get fried by the radiation. And so they, they were very concerned about this, and so they decided to send two precursor, precursor spacecraft, the Pioneers, Pioneer 10 and 11, um, to see if they could resolve this problem. So this was, uh, this is actually, I think, a cigarette card or something, back in the days when people smoked cigarettes, um, of the Grand Tour. Um, and this just shows the alignment of the bodies. This was the, the plan of the Grand Tour, where um, they would actually send two spacecraft uh, to go by them all. But first of all, they had to go and see if it was safe to do that. So this is Pioneer 10. Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to ascend an image back of Europa. Um, it also obtained a lot of information about this, the Jovian system. It survived the asteroid belt with no problems. It didn't get hit by anything. Um, and it learned a lot about the atmosphere um, of Jupiter and also imaged all the moons. Pioneer 11 also um, looked at the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter, but it didn't take any images of the moon. Uh, so this was a, our first real look at Jupiter, uh, uh, sorry, of Europa 
not through a telescope. And you can see on this, let's see if I can do this with my cursor, um, it's very pixelated, it's very blocky, but you can see some variations, sort of light and dark variations on this moon. So this was the first hint that Europa might not be just this uniform ball of ice. Um, but the really exciting stuff started with the Voyager mission. And Voyager was actually two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Um, Voyager 1 launched, so this was the grand tour in full force, right? This was, these spacecraft went to uh, the four giant planets in the end. Uh, and one of them then went out to measure the edge of the solar system, and it's still going. We're still communicating with it today, although it's a very, very, very low power signal. Um, but Voyager 1 was amazing. So it took this great image of Europa, and here we're seeing something that's very smooth, surprisingly smooth. It doesn't look like our moon. It's not covered in impact craters. So we knew something funny was going on. And the scientists described described it as looking like a, a billiard ball where someone had put marker pen on it, um, or a cracked egg, right? They could see all these linear features on it. Um, and it made its closest approach in 1979. Um, Voyager 2 actually uh, made a closest approach slightly earlier, I think, but it launched a couple of weeks later, and it got even higher resolution images of Europa. And here we're starting to see the surface in more detail. There's this strange stuff that they called mottled terrain. They really didn't know what it was. They first thought it might be uh, impact craters, so uh, meteorites and comets that have hit the surface and disrupted it, um, but they weren't really sure what it was. But they could also see these linear features uh, everywhere, very unusual. So the Voyager spacecraft together um, had really sent us a huge amount of information about all of the outer solar system, but especially uh, the Jovian system. So they, they measured the diameters of the four largest satellites called the Galilean satellites after Galileo, because he discovered them. Uh, for Europa particularly, they noticed there were very few impact craters on the surface. That means that it's a very young surface age. Um, I mentioned this mottled terrain. They didn't really know what it was. These lineated planes, they found that a lot of these lines were material where the crust had actually split apart and new material had come up into the gap, um, which is a really bizarre and interesting result. Um, and that the crust was very mobile. They could actually uh, see that it had moved around in plates. Um, and the Voyagers also characterized the Jovian magnetosphere and the plasma environment. So they characterized it such that we knew how to send more spacecraft there that could last a longer time. So Voyager was tremendously important. This is a, a montage of images of the moons, um, Io being the closest and also the most volcanically active, Europa second, not quite so volcanically active, but still very young surface. Um, Ganymede is sort of half and half. Most of the surface is quite old, but some of it is what we call young, probably um, about three billion years, maybe two and a half billion years. And then Callisto is the furthest out, and it's just got a hev very heavily cratered surface. And the reason for this I will come to you later, but they found the moons were ama incredibly amazing. Io was predicted to have volcanism. Uh, there's a landmark paper that was published just a few days before the voyagers got there, and they saw these uh, incredible um, plumes from Io. Uh, so we'd seen volcanism actually happening on another planet for the first time. But Voyager paved the way for the Galileo mission, and, and what we know about Europa now really came from that mission. Um, so the Galileo spacecraft had several issues. It eventually launched uh, from the space shuttle in 1989, but it almost didn't launch at all. It had a lot of problems leading up to the launch. Um, one reason was the Challenger disaster that pretty much grounded everything for several years. Uh, there were also financial problems with Galileo. So what happened was it, it basically sat on the ground in a warehouse somewhere for a very long time when it should have been launched. And so when it did finally launch, um, the high gain antenna which is this thing here. This is an artist's impression of it. Uh, it failed to open. So moving parts in space are something you generally want to avoid if you can, because it's harsh out there. Uh, and so this was supposed to open like a giant umbrella, right? Like a golf umbrella. And it didn't open properly. Um, it had another problem uh, with its tape recorder, because at that time we were still recording data on a tape recorder, and the tape recorder also didn't work very well. So Galileo did drop a probe into Jupiter, and that probe was fully successful. Uh, it went into the red spot of Jupiter and measured things like the water content of the atmosphere. Um, 
but the data return from Europa itself was uh, actually from the whole Jovian system. It was in orbit around Jupiter, flying around the whole system. Uh, but the data return was only about 10% of what it had planned originally, um, which means that we have a lot of very interesting and tantalizing information about the moons, but we don't have anything like what we expected to have. Um, but Galileo was very successful. It took some wonderful data of Europa, and it was soon noticed by the scientists on the mission uh, that the Europa itself was a very special place and a very intriguing place. And so Galileo went into an extended mission phase that was just focused on Europa. And I was actually in graduate school at that time, and I got involved, first of all, looking at Ganymede and then looking at Europa. And so I was involved in that part of the mission towards the, the end of my graduate school days. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Europa. Europa's surface as we've mentioned, there are hardly any impact craters. You can see one of them down here. Uh, this one is thought to be about five million years old, but the surface generally is very young. Um, and it has two major types of terrain. One is called um, ridged plains. It's just lots and lots of these interesting linear features on the surface. And the other type is called chaos terrain. These are regions of the surface that have been completely disrupted into large blocks of ice uh, that look like they're floating. They're not actually floating, but they are in a, a matrix of material in the background. So I'm going to go through some of these. Just move that along. Um, but the really, really exciting thing about Europa from Galileo was the interior. Um, it was discovered that Europa had this uh, it's mostly a silicate body, right? It's like our moon, but it has about a 100 kilometer layer of water ice uh, over the silicate. And most of that is liquid, it's liquid water. So it's got this shell of ice and then a, a subsurface ocean. Um, so in cross section, it probably looks something like this. And the ocean is in contact with the silicate interior, with the mantle. Okay, so that makes it very interesting because it makes it very Earth-like uh, from, from the ocean downwards. Um, how do we know that it has this giant ocean inside? Well, this is another interesting story from Galileo. Um, Europa has a very interesting interaction with that giant Jovian magnetic field that I mentioned earlier. And this is just an artist's impression of, of Europa and then Io uh, going around within the magnetic field. Obviously, we can't see it. It's, it's not visible. Um, but what's interesting about this is that the Jovian magnetic field is tilted at about 10 degrees. Uh, whereas Europa orbits in the plane of the ecliptic of the solar system. So here we see Europa uh, on this red line, just going around Jupiter, minding its own business. Uh, but Jupiter's magnetic field is tilted. And so why was this important? What this means is that uh, Europa's orbit is three and a half days long, but every time Europa goes around Jupiter, it gets either above the plane of, Europa, of Jupiter's magnetic field or below the plane of Jupiter's magnetic field. Okay, so as Jupiter rotates, Europa experiences this time-varying magnetic field. And what Galileo found out was that uh, the magnetometer was able to take data and found that there was actually a change in the magnetic signature inside Europa. Um, and these were directional changes in Europa's magnetic field. So what we think ha is happening is that these changes are consistent with fluctuations that would occur if Europa contained a shell of electrically conducting material. Um, if you had a shell of metal, you could do this. That's very unlikely in Europa, given that it's a, a rocky and icy body. And so the the dominant explanation for this that fits the observations is that there is a salt water ocean. That is what's the conductor that is causing this magnetic change. And so this was a huge, huge result um, from Galileo. And we were able to estimate the depth of that ocean based on these results and also just some um, dynamical considerations. And so what does that mean? That means that Europa has a surprising amount of Earth, probably twice as, a surprising amount of water as the Earth, probably twice as much water, um, which seems counter intuitive. Europa is quite small. If you laid it on top of the US, it would just about fit east to west. Um, but the Earth's oceans are very shallow, right? You, I don't know what the average is. It's probably a couple of kilometers, uh, and they only cover two thirds of the planet, whereas Europa's ocean is global, and it's uh, with the water ice, it's 100 kilometers deep. So a huge amount of water um, on Europa. So why is that there? Why is there even an ocean there? This body has been sitting in the solar system for four and a half billion years. It's very small. Surely it should have frozen out by now. It should be a dead, rocky body, but it isn't. So why isn't it? And this is where we come back to our buddy Pierre Laplace, 
um, who discovered these resonances. And so these are the three innermost Galilean satellites, the three largest moons. Uh, Callisto does not uh, engage in this. Um, but you will see that for every one orbit that Io makes, um, Europa makes half an orbit and Ganymede makes a quarter of an orbit. So basically Ganymede goes around four times for every, two times for Europa, one time for, you, for Io. And as you can see from this animation, this means that the moons interact with each other periodically. And what that means is they're always tugging on each other. Their gravitational pull is always tugging them inside or out. And that has the result of keeping their orbits very slightly eccentric. Okay, so they're not perfectly circular. They're not far off, but they're not perfectly circular. Why is that important? That's important because uh, as Europa goes around Jupiter, um, I, I mentioned earlier that it's in synchronous rotation, at least most of the time. Um, we think it's in synchronous rotation. So one face is locked to Jupiter. But because the orbit is slightly elliptical, it can't keep that face locked all the time. If it was circular, it would have no problem. But instead, it kind of nods from side to side as the gravity is trying to keep um, that face towards the primary. And what that does is it causes tidal heating in the interior. So it's basically frictional heating. It's the same kind of thing if you took a paper clip and just bent it back and forward in your hands for a while, you would find that it gets hot, right? A bicycle pump is another example of this. And that's exactly what's happening on Europa. And that tidal heating, we think, gets deposited in the ice. Um, and the ice can't freeze out. So that's why we still have an ocean there. So there's a lot of heat going into Europa. And um, just to note that Io, which is closer to Jupiter, has even more tidal heating because of the resonance. And Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Um, Ganymede seems to be no longer volcanically active, even though it's also uh, included. So I talked about the age very briefly. Um, these are some of the impact structures on Europa. Um, there aren't many of them at all. Uh, and we have not imaged uh, the whole of the surface of Europa. And the reason for that is because the antenna didn't open. We, we had to scale back a lot of the observations. Uh, but we have seen enough impact features to tell the time on the surface of Europa. So um, as you're probably aware, we tell time in planetary science by looking at the number of impactors that hit a surface. You make assumptions about how constant that rate of impacts uh, is, and then you can uh, back out the time from that. So in the, in the Jovian system, most of the impactors are thought to be Jupiter family comets. Um, but because of the lack of impact craters, we can tell that the surface is somewhere between 40 and 90 million years old uh, on average. Um, we haven't really seen any very old terrains there. And that sounds like a lot, but really in geological terms, as most of you know, that is nothing, right? That's yesterday. Uh, and so there's a very good chance that Europa is still active today, and there's some new evidence that suggests it might be. Um, I do also want to note that a couple of these um, basins, these here, large ones, the multi-ring basins, uh, these sort of fractures around the surface, uh, some of them are graben, but they also look like ripples. They probably penetrated through the ice shell into either the ocean or a very ductile layer at the, at the base of the ice shell. And that's how you get these certain formations. So they probably went through a really thick ice shell, which means they were pretty big impactors. Um, I talked about one of the main terrains on Europa being uh, ridges. This is a great example of one of the most ubiquitous landforms on Europa. It's called a double ridge, and it is exactly what it looks like. Two ridge crests with a very distinct trough in the middle. And as you see in the background, this they come in all different scales, right? The further you look down in Europa, the more of these you see just at smaller and smaller levels. So this is one that um, we... We managed to get topography over this using um, stereo imaging. I'm sorry, it's a little bit jerky. Um, but you can see how well-defined that trough is. Um, we don't have a really good feel for how these form. These are very unusual. We see something like this on Triton, but they're much fewer. They don't appear in all the background terrain as they do here, um, and they're much wider. And we also see something that is starting to look like a ridge on Enceladus. There are some plumes coming out from the ocean of Enceladus, and where they're coming out, there seem to be sort of almost, uh, I don't know, very rudimentary ridges. Um, the ridges are amazing because, like I said, they cover the whole surface, but they also go for, um, sometimes they're hemispherical in length, like they go for thousands of kilometers, uh, and they're very, very uniform throughout. So we don't know exactly how they formed. Um, it's been suggested that they might be volcanic, that these might be volcanic eruptions that are forming these crests, but I have a hard time imagining how they stay so uniform and how you would not 
fill in the central trough if that were the case. Um, other uh, suggestions are that they're caused by some kind of diapyric upwelling that pushes up the flanks. Again, they're very um, distinct, you know, probably more so than that could happen. So the jury's still out on how they formed. What we do know is there is a lot of strike slip along the trough of many of these ridges, and it changes whether you're in the northern or the southern hemisphere of Europa. So it seems to be related to tides. Um, that tidal deformation, if, if an ocean is there and it's as deep as we think it is, the surface will deform by about 30 meters every day, every European day, so every three and a half Earth days. Um, and uh, I've heard it described that if that's happening, Europa will be creaking like a ship. And the reason it will be creaking like a ship is it's fracturing uh, in the ice shell because of this tidal deformation. And we see evidence of strike slip that is consistent with the kind of diurnal stresses that we expect on Europa. And so this is one model that I think nearly everybody agrees is at least one component of ridge formation, where you actually get um, shear stresses along the ridge that probably form some kind of melting. That might be why you get that very distinct trough. But we are still out. I think there are currently seven models for ridge formation, and we can't quite agree on them. Um, another kind of tectonic feature are these. These are um, called dilational bands or pull apart bands. And you can see from the lower image, this is um, the sort of before image, and this is what the surface looks like now. And you can see these pre-existing structures. These are actually double ridges um, that we call piercing points. And if you put this band back together and move them back together, you can see that uh, this band pulled apart completely uh, across a double ridge on the surface. So all of this dark material in this band is completely new. It's come up from the subsurface. And we think it came up as some kind of solid state material. Some of these bands uh, sit a little bit higher than the surrounding terrain. So it's not water that's uh, going in there and freezing. Um, it is probably some kind of uh, ductile upwelling material, maybe slushy. And here's another one down here that exploited two pre-existing ridges to form this band. Um, but what's interesting about these bands, they, they don't uh, ever get wider than about 20 or 30 kilometers. So they, they form and then they stop. And they form symmetrically from a central trough. And so this has led to a model suggesting that they are like mid-ocean ridges on the Earth. Um, when we were able to look at them with high-resolution images, we found a lot of similarities between the kinds of features we see on the Earth and the features we see within these bands. But of course, the main difference is that on the Earth, uh, mid-ocean ridges, it's a, a constant process, right? That material just cools and keeps on moving until it gets subducted or uh, pushed up into mountains. Um, but on Europa, it doesn't. These bands form, and then they stop, probably because the stresses that could have formed them are no longer available. Um, so this leads us to a conundrum. We see a lot of these kinds of bands on the surface of Europa, and we know they are extensional in nature. So we are creating new material on the surface of Europa. This is probably why the surface is so young. Um, one estimate is that about 40% of the surface has been replaced, at least in the areas that we can see, with these new bands that don't have uh, really many impact craters on them. So they're relatively young. Um, but the big conundrum then is, OK, that's fine. You're creating all this new material. But where is all the old material going? Where are all the old impact craters that must have formed on the surface of Europa? Why can't we see them today? Why is the surface only 40 to 90 uh, million years old? And so for many years, we've been trying to solve this problem uh, there have been suggestions that the um, old surface has just been tectonized up, you know, cut so much by these fractures that you can no longer see it. Um, I think we would still see it, so uh, that one probably isn't true. We've also um, suggested that they might be, the contraction might be accommodated by ridges. Um, because there are so many ridges everywhere. But the cross-cutting features uh, that underlie the ridges uh, suggest that that's not the case. If anything like that is happening, it's only very minor. And so this led to um, this model that uh, my colleague Simon Cattenhorn and I came up with a few years ago, where we were reconstructing one of the areas in the north of Europa. Um, and you can, I'm not going to step you through this because it's quite a complicated reconstruction. Uh, but we found that some of these um, bands had been split apart along large transform faults, and they'd been moved a considerable distance. And when we reconstructed this region, so these 
This one is the bottom and this one is the top. Um, we took out all of the uh, younger structures that we didn't need. We found that there was a huge area of missing terrain. So this is what happens when you do a terrestrial plate tectonic reconstruction as well. Um, and it looked like uh, you know, it was completely gone. The only way you can do that is by um, getting rid of that material completely. Um, we did not find evidence of mountains, and so we think that material has gone into the surface, that it has been subducted. And so this is our sort of very uh, general cartoon of what that process looks like. And we actually called these subsumption bands. We had a great discussion about what subsumption means earlier today. Um, but essentially, unlike terrestrial plate tectonics where the plate would go into the mantle and just keep on going, right? And it would start to drag the rest of the plate with it. We don't think that happens on Europa. We think that one plate slides under another and probably ultimately is just incorporated uh, into the ice shell. So maybe not necessarily dissolved, but it just becomes part of the shell above it. Um, we are doing some work to figure out uh, what kinds of density differences do you need. It's not very easy to subduct one ice plate under another and ice wants to float. So we need to add some kind of impurities or porosity differences in order to make that happen. Another issue with this is how do you get the stresses, the large stresses, probably 10 megapascal stresses you would need in order to kick this process off. Um, there are some ways to do it on Europa, but they wouldn't happen very often. So right now we're looking to see whether um, this really is happening. Um, and if so, is it happening anywhere else on the surface? But it may wait until we get much higher resolution data before we can really say for sure um, if this is happening. But right now, there is a, a huge missing chunk of the surface that has to be explained. So if you go back to the observations, uh, this is the most likely observation. Um, let's talk a little bit about cryovolcanism. There are two main kinds of this sort of chaos material that I mentioned earlier. Um, one is called lenticulae, which means freckles in Latin, because that's what they look like. Um, and you can probably see from this image that all of these little round things um, have similar characteristics. They're all subcircular. Some of them have um, sort of what looks like frozen liquid in them. Others haven't even broken the surface very much that we can see. There's, the light is coming from the left here. And then still others have actually broken the surface into um, sort of disrupted material, little plates and blocks. And so just down here, you can see one of these domes. There's just a fracture across the top of the dome. And this is what we call a micro chaos. So the surface here has been broken up into these tiny little plates, almost uh, not much more than the matrix. And here they're slightly larger plates. And you can see the scale bar here, about a couple of kilometers. So how does that happen? Um, we think this happens from ice convection within the shell. The shell is thick enough that convection can take place, um, just like in a lava lamp, right? You've got this uh, viscous material that gets heated from below and comes up to the surface. Um, and this is just another model that my colleague Amy Barr made, um, where you can get this warm flowing ice within the shell. Uh, the question is, how do you break through the top part? The top part is very cold and it's very brittle. And so most of the modelers have trouble breaking through the top part of the shell. And yet the observations show that something is breaking through the shell from underneath. So clearly there is a way to get through here. And it probably is related to those impurities. Um, this is another region of chaos where you can really nicely see all these um, plates and the pre-existing terrain. And you can see from this that you can actually start to put some of these areas back together, like a jigsaw puzzle. You can trace the pre-existing structures uh, within this material and try and put them together. And what we've learned from this is that some of these plates have translated by tens of kilometers, and some of them have rotated by about 40 degrees. Um, and so one of the big questions is, is this background stuff, was this liquid water or was it solid material? Well, you can't translate and rotate um, in solid material very easily, but also you can't do it in liquid water because it would simply freeze, right? 120 Kelvin at the surface here. And so we think that what's going on is there is something that is including brines into the mix. So they would lower uh, the melting temperature of the ice uh, and maybe make it slushy. And so perhaps there's enough going on here um, where these plates can just move around in this sort of background matrix. And there are different kinds of chaos. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. It's a very large screen. Um, but around the edges of this 
material here, there are um, pools of what look like uh, frozen liquid, right? They've embayed the topographic low. So this is just liquid getting trapped in topographic lows. And this one's interesting as well because you can trace the pre-existing structures almost into the center, which looks like this was material that just disaggregated in place. You can still see traces of the structures, even though there are no plates here. Um, this one, um, Mariah's Chaos, we used to call it the mitten because it looks like a mitten. Um, this one is huge. It's about 120 kilometers across, and it's actually flowed across the surface and broken uh, the edge of the plate here. So this was mobile enough to come up to the surface and extend over. And um, this is a small one. This is sort of lenticular that's just a, a frozen pool of melt. And this is actually a little impact crater that just happens to be in the middle, which is why it was uh, called the fishing pond. It never got an official name. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's, it's clearly frozen uh, low, viscos low viscosity material. And then I'm just gonna zoom in on this plate just to give you an idea of the scale here. So check out the scale. This is Connemara Chaos, the region I just showed you. And I'm gonna zoom in on this region here, which is uh, one of the highest resolution images we had from Galileo. And we only had 12 images at this resolution or higher, and they were in two strips of six images. So um, we don't know what the surface looks like at high resolution. And even here, you can see um, this is a 500 meter scale bar. So we wouldn't be able to resolve this auditorium at this resolution. Just to give you an idea of the scale, you might recognize this. <coughs> So I'll just make it go away again. And I'll leave the, what I think is the campus just in the middle. So you can imagine you, if you were on top of that, that would be a big plateau, right? So it might look like there were nice gently rolling hills outside the window, but then you'd come to these big cliffs uh, that would be very hard to uh, navigate. So it's very interesting, a high resolution. Um, one other thing about volcanism on Europa is that uh, a couple of years ago there were some Hubble Space Telescope observations uh, of Europa, of particularly of the limb of Europa, and they found enhancements of hydrogen and oxygen, right? There's an oxygen, uh, we call it an exosphere because it's not very dense there, the, the molecules don't interact with each other. Um, but they found an enhancement in these Hubble images, uh, which were um, interpreted to be evidence of water plumes that are coming out of Europa. And they were interpreted to be 200 kilometers high, which to me seems far higher than is reasonable. But further observations with Hubble since then have suggested that this really might be true. And also the, um, some of the ex-magnetometer team from Galileo have gone back to their magnetometer data uh, and looked for perturbations uh, in the magnetometer data. And they also think they see something that is indicative of plumes. And so if this is true, this means that there is active volcanism uh, or at least geysering, right? Something is going on uh, on the surface of Europa. And I just show the um, picture of Enceladus here where we have seen plumes coming out from the, the subsurface from the ocean. Um, and so it's possible that the European pl plumes are similar to what we see on Enceladus. Although in Europa's case, the ice shell is too thick for them to be coming straight out of the ocean. So we're not entirely sure where they would come from. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about the surface composition. We don't know a whole lot, um, but that's also kind of a whole other talk. Um, but this is uh, a region that we imaged in um, color. This is fairly normal, uh, sort of true color. Um, we see a lot of reddish material associated with these uh, kind of fluid looking plains regions. Um, so there's a lot of icy plains and they get brighter with age and they are very ice rich without a doubt. So the older material on Europa is all ice rich. But we also see uh, magnesium sulfates and so sodium sulfates, um, Epsom salt, which is uh, I think magnesium sulfate, hydrate, no. Yeah, hydrate. Uh, and also um, sulfur, uh, because of the Jovian magnetic field, sulfur is stripped off Io by the Jovian magnetic field and plastered onto Europa. Europa is traveling uh, once every three and a half days around Jupiter, but Jupiter is spinning once every 11 and a half hours. And it's taking this great mass of charged particles with it. And what me that means is that the charged particles of Jupiter are always overtaking Europa and stripping stuff off the surface, stripping stuff off Io, and then plastering the Io sulfur ions onto the surface of Europa, and then radiating anything that happens to be on the surface of Europa. So we see sulfuric acid hydrate, which we think is um, radiated sulfur that has come off Io. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's very difficult to tell whether something's coming up from the interior or whether it's a, a, a radiation product. Uh, and this red material, frankly, we don't know what it is. We know there are salts on the surface, but salts tend to be colorless, and this is red. So it's probably some kind of silicate material. It might be the remnants of comets uh, or other bodies that have impacted into Europa, but we don't really know for sure. <clears throat> 
So, what do we know about Europa? Well, the interesting thing about Europa and the reason why there is now going to be a mission there is because we think that Europa probably has the right ingredients for life. And I'm just showing a little clip of a hydrothermal vent down here in the corner. Um, we know it has a huge amount of water, not just water, but salt water, right? More than twice as much as the Earth's oceans. Um, it has the same elements we think that we have on the Earth, right? So essential elements from formation and impacts that could form organic molecules. Uh, chemical energy, uh, the radiation environment we think causes oxidation on the surface. And the seafloor, uh, what's interesting about this is the water is in direct contact with uh, the rocky mantle, so just like on the Earth. So there could be um, other uh, chemistry going on, probably reductants being formed on the seafloor. And those two things form chemical disequilibrium, right? That's how life uh, exists on the Earth. And so this chemical energy from above and below could result in necessary ingredients for life. And then finally, stability. This ocean has been there, we think, for four billion years. Um, the depth of the ice shell may change. We think it's thickening out right now, but the ocean itself has been there for a long time. So we think we have all the right ingredients for life on Europa. Does that mean there's life there? We don't know, right? We have no idea, and we don't know what it would look like. Um, but certainly, if it is Earth-like, then we have the right ingredients. So this has led to calls for another mission. Okay, so this was Galileo. Galileo finished, I think, in 2003. So it's been a while since we've um, gone back to the outer solar system. So any ne new mission needs to do the following science. So. We are going back to Europa. Uh, the next step is really to explore its habitability. Is it really a habitable world? Does it really have the ingredients for life? And this might mean things like looking at the salinity of the ocean and understanding if it's in the right uh, zone for life to exist, or is it too saline, for example? Um, and so the next mission, the one that we are planning right now, is going to study the ocean and the ice shell, try and get to the thickness of the shell, and uh, what is going on in the shell? How are things moving? Is subduction happening? Um, what is the diapirism doing? Is material getting from the ocean to the surface uh, and vice versa, right? If it is, that could be very important. Uh, the geology is just super cool, right? It's one of the most incredible places in the solar system, um, especially if you're into structure or morphology. There's nothing really like it. Um, an amazing array of features and we just don't know how they form. Composition is really important. If we can get a good handle on the composition, we'll understand a lot more about how some of these features form. We can feed those uh, data into our models. And then finally, reconnaissance for future lander. I mentioned that those high resolution images uh, still wouldn't resolve this room. And yet, if you're putting a lander down on Europa, it's going to be probably a very, very expensive lander. It's probably going to be the most sophisticated lander that anyone's ever built. And the surface, this is six meters per pixel. So I might just about get this auditorium here. Um, but my lander is probably going to have something like a three meter baseline. And as you can see, there aren't any nice, flat, smooth places to land on Europa. It's a pretty rugged and harsh environment, as far as we can tell. And so we need to do very high resolution imaging to understand what the surface looks like um, at a lander scale, better than a lander scale. So this is the mission that NASA is going to fly, and it started to build it. So we spent about 10 years trying to um, find the money and the support for this mission to fly. And it was finally um, selected by NASA about three years ago. So at the moment, we're in something called phase B. We're still in the design stage. Um, and we're about to move into phase C, I think in October, which is where we actually start cutting metal and building things. So. Um, that's a very significant point. It's a really, really big spacecraft. Um, I don't know if I've got the, the sizes on here. So you, this is the high gain antenna, right? It's fixed. It doesn't open like an umbrella because we learned that lesson from Galileo. So this is three meters across. So you can kind of get a feel for how big the spacecraft is. Um, I think it's something like 16 meters end to end, but they keep changing the sizes of the solar panels. Right now it has four and a half solar panels on each side. Um, incidentally, we were going to do this with nuclear power, but um, there is a, a government rule where you, if you have to look at a mission and see if you can do it with solar panel, because we don't want to launch any more nuclear material than we have to. Uh, and we found that actually we could do this with very large solar panels, even at Jupiter's distance. Um, I'm not going to go into everything here, but the main thing is that 
uh, it has two sets of instruments. One points down at the surface and one points out uh, in front of the spacecraft. And the reason for that is so that it can sample, sniff and taste the environment as it goes through Jupiter. Um, and there are a lot of booms. There's a, a magnetometer boom here. Uh, and these are the things that are sticking out, all these appendages. These are radar antennas, uh, which need to be very large. So this spacecraft is going to be launched on a large um, rocket and then it's going to kind of unfold itself. Hopefully everything will work just fine. So it's pretty amazing. So the mission concept, we are not going into orbit around Europa. An, an earlier concept did do that, but we found the radiation environment was um, just going to kill us uh, before we lasted for a year. We wanted to last a little longer than that. So this new mission concept has us in orbit around Jupiter, but we are going to fly in and out of the radiation belts at an angle, and we are going to encounter Europa at various different places in its orbit. So the idea here is that we will build up this global uh, coverage, almost all of it. I, I think we even get the poles. Poles are usually hard to do. Um, but we're going to build up coverage of the surface over, uh, I think, currently 42 encounters. Um, with Europa, and some of those are going to go extremely close to the surface, so we're going to get very high resolution imaging data, about 50 centimeters per pixel, so it's much better for finding a safe place to land in the future. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through this. I'm nearly at the end here, but um, one of the, the problems with Galileo, because of the issues with the tape recorder and the antenna, is that we have data from different instruments that the spacecraft carried, but they are not always in the same place. So sometimes we would see a really interesting geological feature, and there would be no composition data about it, because they were looking off at another interesting compositional feature. Um, and so we, we decided right from the start, when we started planning this mission, that we were going to ensure that every instrument should be on all the time and point at the same spot on the surface um, if it was a pointed instrument. And so um, I'm just going to show you how that's going to work. So we call this synergistic science, and I think it's going to be extremely powerful when we get the data back. Um, so this uh, mission is going to do a gravity experiment. Just about to see that moving. Um, you can't do gravity so well from flybys as you can in orbit, but we can uh, figure out uh, for sure whether there's an ocean there. I mean, I think we all are pretty certain that it's there, but we want to verify it. Uh, and we may be able to tell whether there are gravity anomalies um, either within the shell, which is probably unlikely, or on the ocean floor if we're very lucky and we go close enough. Um, we are also going to do uh, the magnetometer experiment that Galileo did, but of course we're doing 42 flybys and we're going through the whole system, which is very good for that instrument, and measuring the plasma, so understanding the environment. Uh, imaging, really important that we see the surface. So we've got two cameras. One is a sort of lower resolution color imager and one is a very high resolution. Uh, actually, I think that's now color as well. We just added color to that. That's only going to do postage stamps, but we only need those for uh, to characterize landing sites. Uh, infrared spectrometry, so understanding the composition of the surface. And you can see that, you know, in the animation here, or this, this image, we're just looking at the same place with all these instruments at once. Um, thermal instrument, that's, that's important because if something is erupting right now, it's going to have a thermal signature. Or even if it recently erupted, maybe in the last few million years, it might still have a thermal signature. And so we want to know where the hotspots are. We want to know where is Europa active today. The radar, those, all those antennas that I showed you, are uh, really important for getting through the ice. Um, if the ice is cold and clean, we might be able to get through to the ocean. If the ice, as is more likely, is going to have impurities in it, and it's probably um, thermally heterogeneous, uh, then we may not get as far into it. But we have two modes. One is going to look at the, the near surface, the first three kilometers in a lot of detail, and the other mode is going to try and get deeper into the ice. But we'll be able to see the substructure of a lot of these uh, interesting features on the surface. Uh, we are carrying an ultraviolet spectrometer that uh, is really going to be most useful for looking at plumes uh, off the limb of Europa, but we can also do some surface composition with it. And we have uh, gas and dust mass spectrometers that are going to be facing forward. So if we see a plume and it's active, we will be able to fly through it and taste it with the gas and dust mass spectrometers and figure out where those particles came from within the shell. So it's a, an amazingly sophisticated payload, uh, and we are, I think, going to learn a huge amount about Europa. Uh, this is the trajectory. Um, we are hoping to launch on a rocket that hasn't been built yet uh, called the Space Launch System, but this is going to be used to take humans to Mars if we end up going down that route or humans to anywhere that humans want to go in the solar system. Um, 
without going into too much uh, detail here, that we would launch in 2022, that's the current plan, and this rocket is so large that it would get us to the Jovian system in um, just under three years. With conventional rockets that can do this, we would take a lot longer. We would take six years to get there, and none of us are getting any younger, so we want to go as fast as possible. And then finally, um, this is another concept that NASA is looking at right now. This has not been funded for flight, uh, but they are in the process of coming up with uh, mission concepts and also science goals for this. This is uh, the current image of a Europa lander, which, as you can see, is actually landed in a very nice flat portion of Europa that I'm not really sure exists, but anyway, but it's a nice idea. And so um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has been uh, looking at various iterations of legs. How could you land in such an environment that might have valleys and crevasses? You know, anyone of, who's ever been on a glacier and seen the crevasses on the glacier will know that could be what we're looking at uh, on the surface of Europa. So this kind concept is, is still being worked right now, uh, and it may or may not go ahead, uh, just depends on funding. So just to summarize, um, Europa is certainly a recently active moon and possibly even currently active, and it has a, a very high significance as a potentially habitable world. It's an ocean world. Um, NASA recently selected a multiple flyby mission to go and study it, so this will be the future exploration of Europa. Uh, the earliest launch is in 2022, so we're certainly hoping that will happen. Uh, and so we're very close to the next phase of Europa exploration. Um, and as my friend Bob, Bob Pavelada, who's a project scientist on the, the Europa Clipper mission, it's called the Europa Clipper, I don't think I mentioned that, uh, he always likes to, to tie it back to Galileo and to say that um, if life was discovered at Europa, it could spawn a whole new scientific revolution. Um, how interesting to think that one of Galileo's little stars may again change our sense of place in the universe. Thank you very much.